Okay, honors chemistry people, we are going to continue on to nuclear chemistry. Oh, looks like it didn't really record what I did last time. All right, so nuclear chemistry, we're into chapter four. So the first thing I wanna do is I want to um, tell you that in order to do nuclear chemistry, we're going to really have to go back to our atomic theory ideas. We're going to have to remember that in the atom, we have two subatomic particles in the atom, in the nucleus, and we're going to, not in the atom, but in the nucleus, we're going to really be paying attention to the number of protons in an atom and the number of neutrons in an atom. We're not super going to be paying attention to the electrons in the atom. Now, the, that's one of the reasons that it's called nuclear chemistry, because when we do nuclear chemistry, we're dealing with the nucleus of the atom. We're doing reactions that change the nucleus of the atom. Okay, so let's do a little comparison and contrast with chemical versus nuclear reactions. Now, you've all seen chemical reactions before because we've all sat around a fire, a campfire, or we've watched things bake in the oven or whatever. So chemical reactions, here where the, the match is. Let's get some. So we're going to look at this side first. Chemical reactions occur when bonds are broken or formed. So we're really creating or destroying bonds when we have a chemical reaction. They involve only the valence electrons. And we haven't really talked about what valence electrons are yet. We will get into that when next chapter when we do, um, do the periodic table. But valence electrons are the outermost electrons or the electrons in the outermost shell of the atom. They are associated with small energy changes. Now we see, oh my gosh, they're not small. I mean, I get a lot of heat out of the oven to cook my food, or I get a lot of heat out of burning wood at the campfire. But compared to nuclear, it's very, very small amounts of energy. Atoms get to keep their same identity. Although they might gain or lose or share electrons to form new substances. So the atoms don't change. We don't change their proton numbers. So the identity of the atom does not change. We will share, gain, or lose electrons. And that is a process calling, called oxidation and reduction, which most chemical reactions are. Um, and then last but not least, temperature, pressure, concentration, and catalyst affect those reaction rates. And you've probably seen that a lot. Think about how, if you have an Alka-Seltzer tablet, for example, one of those fizzy tablets that you might take if you're not feeling well, um, you put that into water and it dissolves and it fizzes. But if I took the time to crush up that Alka-Seltzer tablet before I put it into water, it would go super fast. So the more surface area I have will affect the rate of the reaction, it will affect it upwards. Or if I have hot water versus cold water, the hot water will make that Alka-Seltzer tablet dissolve faster as well. So temperature does affect things. Let's talk about the nuclear side today. Okay, nuclear reactions occur when nuclei combine, split, or emit radiation. So when nuclear combine, when we combine things, that is called fusion. Because we're fusing atoms. So that's a combination of nuclei. Okay. Um, when they split, it's called fission. So that's when a nucleus splits into two or more smaller elements. And most of the um, nuclear pl power plants, well, actually all of the nuclear power plants and things that we have in today's world that run off of nuclear are all fission. 
we are trying to figure out how to do fusion. Right now, we, the only fusion reaction, reactions that we can really do are hydrogen bombs. We have not been able to figure out how to, to harness fusion, fusion reactions for energy right now. Um, that is pretty much the golden standard of, of energy. If we can figure out how to, to harness fusion, we will essentially have an unlimited supply of energy and we'll never have to worry about energy ever again. Okay, um, nuclear reactions can involve protons, neutrons, and electrons. We are really gonna focus on the protons and the neutrons. We are gonna see how some electrons play into some of these. They're associated with tremendously large energy changes. So think about if you've done world history, think about World War II and ending the war with the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the energy that was associated with that. It was, it was on the magnitude that the earth hadn't ever seen before. And hydrogen bombs are even more powerful than that. Atoms of one element, this next one, atoms of one element are often converted into atoms of another element. More often than not, they are, unless we're doing a gamma reaction. And then last but not least, temperature, pressure, and catalysts do not normally affect these. So they don't go by our normal reaction rate laws at all. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is ionizing radiation. Now, we haven't really talked about ions. Ions are atoms that have a charge. So if I am making... If I am making an ion, then I am making something that has a charge. So ionizing radiation is um, when an ionizing particle or a, a wave, an energy wave. So we could have an ionizing particle. Is this going to let me write? Oh my. I don't want to get in quantum. Okay. When we have a particle or energy um, let's see gamma rays or wave an energy wave that has enough energy to knock electrons out of, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say orbit around an atom. So it takes the electron away. So the electron leaves the atom, which leaves normally a positively charged ion behind, okay? Now think about this. We've created an ion. Think about if you've been hit by some of this ionizing radiation and it creates an ion maybe in your DNA as it goes through one of the cells in your body. Ionizing radiation, if it hits the right part of your DNA, it can create a mutation that could create cancer. This is why we are so worried about ionizing radiation when it comes to our cells or creating cancer or creating mutations. One of the biggest forms of ionizing radiation that we as people are exposed to is the ultraviolet or the UV radiation from the sun. 
So anytime we walk outside and we are exposed to the sun, we have ionizing radiation coming and hitting us, our skin, our tissues, etc. And some of it is powerful enough, almost all UV is powerful enough to actually knock an electron out of orbit and create an ion. Okay, just a little side note here. How many of you guys have had sunburns? Sunburns are actually a radiation burn. So that means that you're, you've been out in the sun long enough that your skin is actually sending a distress signal because it's been out for so long. You've, you've burned your skin radiation-wise from the ultraviolet. That's why UV or sunburns don't show up immediately either because radiation sickness is kind of an after the effect type of thing. Okay, here we go. Another experiment to show us, we have three different types of radiation. This experiment was done by none other than Mr. Rutherford. And it should look very similar to his gold foil experiment. We still have our lead block here with a radio active source. He used um, uranium and thorium. He then put a slot here to make sure that the radiation could only go one direction. Now this is where it's different. Instead of having gold foil, he put it through an electrical field. So notice we have a negative plate here and we have a positive plate here. And we still have our same zinc sulfide screen so that we can see where that radiation is hitting. Remember the zinc sulfide will fluoresce or you'll see a little flash of light where radiation is hitting. So when Ernst Rutherford, Ernest Rutherford and his team did this, they were able to see three main areas of where the energy was located. They noticed that one energy was deflected toward, one area was deflected toward the positive plate so if it's deflected towards the positive and we have ions going on, don't opposites attract? So could we surmise then that this beta is a negative if it's attracted to the positive plate? Indeed it is. Beta particles have a negative one charge, okay? And notice it was deflected pretty far off the normal path. So if you are able to deflect something pretty well, that means it's actually fairly light. Lighter things are a lot easier to move than heavier things. So beta particles are essentially an electron coming from the nucleus. And yes, I did say nucleus. There are sub subatomic particles in the nucleus that are negative. Really the only thing that makes a proton different from a neutron is the neutron has a little bit of an extra particle associated with it that is negative so that it's not, so its net charge is neutral instead of positive like a proton. So basically a beta particle is that negative sub subatomic particle within a neutron that can sometimes be kicked out of, an, of a nucleus. And so it will be a negative particle coming out of a nucleus. So essentially we have a mass of one and a charge of negative one, okay? Now there is another way to write electro or write a beta particle. Sometimes we will write it as an E with an electron. So both of these ways are totally acceptable. Now the second particle that they noticed was coming straight out. It wasn't deflected either from the positive plate or the negative plate. So if it's not deflected at all, we can surmise that this gamma ray that they called it has absolutely no charge. Now gamma rays are exactly that. They're rays. They're really not particles. They're high energy photons. And yes, technically we've been able to measure some mass with photons, but for all intensive purposes, these have no mass 
and no charge. So gamma rays, we write them like this, no mass, no charge, okay? And I am not very good at drawing the gamma symbol. So this is a better approximation right there. All right, um, next thing, they notice a third and it was deflected towards the negative plate. So if it's deflected towards the negative plate, we can assume that it is positive because once again, opposites attract. Now, notice it's not deflected very far off of the center. So since the deflection is not very far, we can also assume that it is relatively heavy compared to say a beta particle. Now alpha particles are indeed positively charged. They have a positive plus two charge. They are essentially a helium nucleus. So they have two protons and two neutrons. So they have a mass of four and they're essentially a helium nucleus. Now, when we write the alpha particles, we will write it as a helium nucleus. It does have a plus two charge, but this plus two charge up here in the upper right hand corner where we show that it is positive, positively two charged, we really don't normally write that. So if you see something that's written just like this, you'll see that that is an alpha particle. Now there is another way that we also write the alpha particle. We can also write it like this. Is it not going to let me write? 4, 2, with an alpha symbol. So either way of writing those is totally acceptable. Okay, so these are our three types of radiation decay that we see. We see beta, we see gamma, and we see alpha. So, and these were discovered by Ernst Rutherford. Okay, now I have put a video on where they demo the different types of radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma, and how far they are able to penetrate. I just wanna talk about how far they are able to penetrate and just kind of um, remind you of what you saw in that video. Now alpha, because it's not very, it's very heavy, I should say, because it's very heavy, it's not able to travel very far. Alpha will only travel a couple of feet, honestly, like maybe three feet. And because alpha is pretty big, that it is a, a oh my gosh, please let me write. It is, it's a helium nucleus. So it's fairly big, it's fairly heavy, it won't travel very far. And because it's got two protons and two neutrons for a total mass of four, it won't go through a lot of stuff. So even if you have paper for the alpha particle, it will block it. Your skin will actually block alpha particles really well. So alpha particles really don't give you that much of a, a radiation danger. The only danger that alpha particles will really give you radiation wise is if you inhale them or if you actually end up eating them in some ways. Now that's really, really rare to do, but there was a, a little spy intrigue going on in, when was this? 2010, I believe it was. It was in London, England. In 2010 in London, England, there was an old KGB agent. Now the KGB is like the, the old Soviet Union FBI slash CIA. They're, they're, they're the agents that kept Russian state secrets, prosecuted and did, did stuff. So there was an old KGB um, person who was living in London at the time, he had defected from the Soviet Union because he was an old double agent and he had actually worked for the um, MI5 
out of London, he started coming down sick with something in 2010. And he went to the hospital there in London and they couldn't figure out what was going on with him for a while, for a couple of days. Then after a couple of days, they realized that he was being poisoned with alpha particles. Um, he was being poisoned with polonium 210. Someone had laced his food with polonium 210. And the person who was in charge or running Russia at that time was still Vladimir Putin. And Vladimir Pers Putin used to work for the GRU, which was the head of the KGB. So I'm sure he sent people there to kill this old double agent. And yes, by the time they figured out it was alpha poisoning, it was too late. And this agent did die of poisoning. Okay, so yes, this kind of stuff does still happen in the world. Um, beta, beta particles, remember beta particles are essentially an electron, okay? So they don't have much mass, and so they're able to travel a little bit farther, a little bit faster because it's not nearly as much mass. So beta particles will go through paper, but if you have a decent amount of metal, they will be blocked. So if you get behind a metal shield, you will be able to be safe from beta particles. If you ever gone to the hospital or a clinic and gotten an x-ray, you have been exposed to beta particles. Most x-rays are beta. And if you noticed, they put one of those metal lead shields over you so that only the part of your body that they wanted to x-ray you was exposed. And if you also notice, the clinician went and stood behind a wall, and lo and behold, that wall is lead lined. It is, and they have that leaded glass to also shield the clinician. And then last but not least, we have gamma. Gamma, because it has, it's essentially a high energy electromagnetic wave it can go through pretty much anything. It will go through paper, it will go through aluminum, it will go through lead. So in order to really block um, gamma rays, you need like six to 12 foot concrete walls that are reinforced with steel. So if you go back to the old nuclear bunkers, especially in the, the missile silo sites, you will see that those bunkers are 10, 12 feet thick reinforced steel concrete walls. I had the chance to go into a Minuteman silo about 10 years ago when I was traveling through South Dakota. It's actually a national monument, so you can sign up. It's called Minuteman Missile Silo. It's pretty cool if you're ever found, find your way in South Dakota. Okay, let's talk about balancing these chemical equations. We have modes of decay. Don't you love that they kept the, the bells going even though you guys aren't here? Anyway, we have three modes of decay. We have alpha, beta, and gamma, and we're gonna practice balancing some of these equations. So alpha decay, an ordinary helium nucleus is released from an unstable nucleus. This is usually what happens when the nucleus is super heavy and it wants to get a little bit lighter to be stable. Now remember, the last naturally occurring element is uranium, and it has 92 protons in it, but it's not stable. The last stable element on the periodic table is actually lead. Everything above lead is radioactive, and most of those are going to be decaying from alpha, by beta and alpha particles in a, in a, in a try, they're going to try to get to a stable um, configuration. And that usually happens when we get back down to lead 207. So it usually takes quite a while. So here we go. We've got radium here. Remember this top number is our mass number and this bottom number is our proton number. So if I look at radium 226, it will decay with an alpha particle. So we've got our alpha particle with two protons and two neutrons. So a mass number four 
and two protons. And what's left with that decay is we have a radium to radon, we have 222 for our mass number and 86 for our proton numbers. Now, let's look at this with conservation of mass in mind. Now, didn't Antoine Lavoisier say that we could not change matter, we couldn't destroy it, or we couldn't create it? Now, this is true even with nuclear equations. So notice our mass number of 226 with the radium is equal to 222 plus 4. So we have not created or destroyed any of the mass in this equation. And our protons, 88 protons, is equal to 86 protons plus 2, two protons. So we haven't destroyed the protons either. We've just split that nucleus into two. So we do have conservation of mass. So when we balance these equations, the mass numbers on each side have to equal, and the proton numbers on each side of the equation have to equal. Okay, notice I put in this reaction arrow here so that we know that this is our reactant side of the equation and this is our product side of the equation, okay? So let's look at another example here. Hmm, I, I don't know why it's not letting me scroll. And then all of a sudden it is. Okay, here we go. We have plutonium. Notice we have our mass number 239 and our proton number of 94. We will have, I'm gonna put an arrow in here again. We will have an alpha particle being released from that heavy, heavy nu nucleus. And we will also have uranium 235 produced. So 239 is equal to 4 plus 235, right? Our mass is conserved. And 94 right here is equal to 2 plus 92, okay? Our mass of protons is conserved as well. So this is how we're going to do this. Now, alpha emission of americium-241. Now, remember, when we have notations like this, the number past the dash here is our mass number. So I'm going to put down the symbol for americium, and I'm going to write it in the other notation, americium-241. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have the whole entire periodic table memorized. And yes, I don't have it memorized, and I've been doing chemistry for a long, long time. So what we want to do is we want to look at the periodic table and we want to look up americium. So let's look up americium because we want to see how many protons americium has. So if I look up, americium is right here. I've got 95 protons on americium. So let's write that in here. I've got 95 protons in americium. Now, I'm gonna have my alpha emission going here. So if I have alpha, I'm gonna have two protons and four total mass numbers being taken away. Now I have to figure out what's left. So 241 minus four will give me 237 for my mass number. And 95 minus two will give me 93. Now the next thing I need to do is I need to look up on my periodic table what has 93 protons. So let's look at the periodic table. So if I look at the periodic table, 93 protons is neptunium. 
So I have an, an atom now of neptunium. So I'm going to put that down here. So neptunium. Okay. So NASA uses the alpha decay of plutonium-238 as a heat source on spacecraft. Yeah, they do. So we want to write a balanced equation for this. Once again, we're going to do an alpha decay. We're going to start with plutonium-238. So once again, alpha, I could write it like this. I could also write it like this. Either way is good. I'm good with either way that you want to write it. Now, most, most scientists, most chemists are going to write it with the helium, but some, some do write it with the alpha symbol. Either way is good. Let's figure out what's left. 238 minus 4 gives us 234. 94 minus 2 gives us 92. So let's look at the periodic table and see what has 92 protons. So if I look for 92 protons, I have uranium. So this is now a uranium atom. So we're going to put that down. Uranium. Okay, so notice that the mass number is conserved on both sides of the equation, and the proton number is also conserved on both sides of the equation. Okay, let's get into some beta now. Okay, beta, an electron is given off by an unstable nucleus. So, for example, if I have iodine-131 and I have a beta particle, remember a beta particle has a charge of negative one and zero mass. So if I write in my equation here, 131 is equal to 131, plus zero, right? So our mass number, the beta particle has no mass. So our mass of the daughter element or the daughter isotope does not change, but the proton number does. 53 is equal to 54 plus a negative one, right? So 54, when we look on our periodic table, we will go and make a xenon atom, okay? Once again, mass number and proton numbers have to be conserved in these equations. Let's look at carbon-14. I want you to pay special attention to this neutron right here. Now, if I have carbon-14, it's got a few more neutrons than what makes it stable. And so one of those neutrons is going to want to change to a proton. And to do that, it will kick out a beta particle, okay? And notice that proton th that was here was that neutron. So getting rid of that negative particle created a neutron turning into a proton. That's what's happening with a beta emission. Notice, once again, our mass number does not change, okay? 14 equals zero plus 14. And six is equal to negative one plus seven. And notice, because I have another proton now, I don't have a carbon atom anymore, I have a nitrogen atom. So when we date things with carbon 14, we're looking at the ratio of carbon 14 to carbon 12. And that carbon-14, when it decays, turns into nitrogen. Okay, let's do a, a practice balance of that. So we want to do a beta emission of rubidium-87. So I'm going to write rubidium here. I don't know how many protons rubidium has. 
So let's look at our periodic table for rubidium. So rubidium is right here. Let's, we've got 37 protons. So I'm going to put 37 down there. And we are going to do a beta admission. So beta can be written like this, or it can be written like this. Either way, okay? So if I look at my what's left over, 87 minus 0 is still 87. So my mass number doesn't change. Now this is where it gets kind of tricky. 37 minus a negative 1. Now remember, when you subtract a negative, it actually becomes a positive. So I want you to think of it this way. 37 plus 1, right? 37 minus a negative 1 becomes 37 plus 1. So we actually are going to have 38 protons. So let's look and see on our periodic table what has 38 protons. So if we look at that, we're looking at strontium. So we have now made strontium atom. So we will have strontium. Okay, so notice our mass numbers are conserved and our proton numbers are conserved. Hey, let's look at writing a balanced nuclear equation for the beta decay of cesium-137. So I'm going to start with cesium-137. Now, I don't know cesium's proton number, so let's look up cesium's proton number. So cesium, we have 55 protons. So I'm going to put 55 protons there. Oh, it didn't keep my stuff. So cesium, 137. And we said it had 55 protons. We're going to create a beta particle. We know it's going by beta. Now you can use this symbol if you'd rather. And let's see what's left. So 137 minus 0 is still 137. And 55 minus a negative 1 becomes 55 plus 1, so we will have 56 protons. Okay, let's see what element has 56 protons. Let's look on our periodic table. So 56 protons, we will have barium. So we are going to write barium here. Okay? So this is how you balance beta. Once again, protons and mass numbers are conserved. Okay? Gamma are basically high energy photons. They don't change the mass or the atomic nucleus. So they remain unchanged. So notice here in this example, I've got uranium-238 and an alpha particle. And usually if we have alpha or beta re reactions going, we also have gamma. But it doesn't change. Even if I just had the alpha particle shown, I would still end up with thorium. The gamma doesn't change what's really going on because it doesn't change the mass and it doesn't change the proton number. It does change the energy. So we're going to think of this as pretty high energy. And then because the gamma is energy, and we also conserve energy, we're going to think of both of these, because I have gamma, as lower energy. Because they are going to be lower energy. Because we're releasing energy. The 2 in front of the gamma symbol indicates that two gamma rays of different frequencies are admitted. Because gamma rays have no effect on the mass number or the atomic number, it's customary to omit them or not write them in nuclear equations. Okay, so we're going to leave it at that for today. Um, we do talk about penetrating power a little bit. I already talked about that. Um, so we have positron emission and we have K-capture emission, but those are really special and we are going to 
leave it off here today. Okay, and we were going to talk about the summary a little bit tomorrow. Hope you had a great day. We'll talk to you later. Bye.